welcome guys, welcome. I'm just looking for, here it is. By now, many of you might remember that this month we're dealing with contentment. And what does contentment mean again? Contentment is deciding to be happy with what you've got. Today, we will be answering another letter from a kid just like you on different things they go through. And I wanted to read this one because, well, let's hear what it says. From a girl named Cynthia. Dear Kevin Girl, for Christmas, my parents got me a dollhouse with furniture. Five dolls, a drone, two video games, a life-size bear with a pair of earrings and a makeup kit. And that's it. So I asked my mom if I could have a new telescope. And she said no, because the old one was fine. Could you believe it? So I went to my dad and he told me to be content with what I had. I figured the only way to be totally and utterly content is more of everything. That's exactly what I need. More stuff. How can I get my parents to see that? Signed, does anyone know Mary Poppins? Right? The Bible says in Philippians 4 verse 12b, I have learned the secret of being content no matter what happens. I am content whether I am well fed or hungry. I am content whether I have more than enough or not enough. Sounds like symphony needs a conversation with Paul, but we'll get to that. As always, today's lessons are focused on our kids electric students in grades one through six and our harvest adventures in preschool. Be sure to pay close attention to what's happening so you don't miss out on any part of our amazing story or the super cool fun happening in Kids in Action. Why don't you check them out and I'll see you when you get back. Welcome back to Kids in Action, where every experiment sparks excitement and every object lesson brings the Bible to life. It's time to unleash the power of faith in action with Kids in Action. Hello everyone, my name is Tika and I am here with my amazing assistant, Brian. All month long, we are talking about contentment. Brian, can you tell everyone what our definition of contentment is? Contentment is deciding to be happy with what you've got. Dun, 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 dun. How many of you have seen one of these? Maybe you have one at home or something a little similar. Brian, do you have one of these? Hmm, I do, but mine actually is shape of a globe. Hmm. Now, what do you use this for? Mm, to store money or to save money. Exactly. Saving money is a good thing. Now, I know you may not have a job yet because you're still young in school and in extracurricular activities, but maybe you could still earn some money. How, how can you do that? Maybe an allowance or extra chores. Yeah. That's a great way to get money at your age and maybe even Christmas or birthday money that others might give to you. Now, let's say you have your eye on a new toy or a video game that's being released in, say, September. So you need to save for it, but you realize you don't have enough money saved. So maybe you do more chores and then some more chores and then you can get more and more money for what you want. But what happens when getting money becomes the most important thing to you? Is that a good thing? Probably not. What if I were to say today is your payday? Ooh. And you don't even have 
to work to get paid. How would you feel about that? Are you serious? How much money is in there? Let's just say money is not an issue for this payday. <laughs> oh boy, I can buy all the clothes and the video games and the shoes and <laughs> especially those horns. Yep, you could do a lot with that money. But there's just one problem. What's the problem? This is what I meant. Uh, I know you might be a little disappointed about that, little. but maybe you weren't daydreaming about this, but daydreaming about spending money for what you didn't have to work for. When we focus more on money and things, it starts to control our thoughts, and then it could end up controlling everything about you. I already feel miserable because I was hoping that you would pay me. This could get out of control and make you absolutely miserable. I already feel miserable because I was hoping you are going to pay me. I did pay you. That's your payday. It's a chocolate bar. It's all yours. God wants us to be content with what we have, not focus on what we don't have or getting more. Because when we get so focused on our stuff, and getting more stuff, we can really miss out on what really matters. Well, I guess I should be content. I mean, it's a free chocolate bar. I'd never work for that. That's the spirit. Let's check out our Bible story today and see how this all connects. Bye-bye. Bye. The Bible has lots of stories, lots of characters, and lots of amazing truth in it. The part of the Bible that we're going to read today is a part where Jesus tells a parable. A parable is a story that teaches a truth about God. The story, or this parable, has an interesting character in it. Jesus tells us about this guy in the book of Luke, in chapter 12 to be exact. This guy was no ordinary fool. He was a rich guy, and he wasn't exactly the wisest guy on the planet either. Now remember, Jesus is God. That means he is the wisest of the wise. That's why people would go to Jesus with questions. Jesus would sometimes answer those questions by telling a story or a parable. One such parable that Jesus told came after someone shouted out something in a crowd. Jesus was often surrounded by crowds and crowds often shouted lots of things. In Luke chapter 12, verse 13, Someone from the crowd shouted out, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family property with me. It seemed as though this person who shouted this out, we'll call him Jed, and his brother, we'll call him Obi, lived on land their family owned. Normally, when a father passed away, the land, the family property, was given to the sons. The oldest son would get the most. The sons would become the new owners of the land. It was their inheritance, which is kind of like a great big allowance. It sounded like Jed wanted more of the family land than he got. In verse 14 and 15, Jesus said, Friend, who made me judge or an umpire between you two? Watch out. Be on your guard against wanting more and more things. Life is not made up of how much a person has. Now, just in case you miss that, I'm going to say it again. So listen carefully. This is what Jesus said. Friend, who made me a judge or an umpire between you two? Watch out. Be on your guard against wanting more and more things. Life is not made up of how much a person has. Well, that is not at all what Jed wanted to hear. He started to protest. But Jesus started telling him and the crowd who was there this parable. A certain rich man's land produced a very large crop. In other words, this rich man had lots of farmlands and this season his crop was huge. It was overflowing. There was so much corn and wheat and barley and beans. It was the biggest crop yet. He tried to store it in his storehouse, but unfortunately, it was too small. He wasn't sure what to do. Then the rich man had a thought, aha, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my storehouses and build bigger ones. That way I can store everything. But what if, and this part isn't in the parable, 
that same person pointed out a pretty obvious fact. You have way more than you need, sir. You don't need more money and you certainly don't need more food. What if you just gave it away? Gave it away? The rich man might have, might have cried. Are you nuts? This food is all mine. That's why I'm building the storehouse huge in the first place. It's all mine, I tell you. So the rich man had huge barns and storehouses built to hold all the food his fields had yielded. Then the man said to himself, Self, you have done good work here. You have plenty of grain stored away for years to come. You know what? I'm going to take life easy from here on out. I'm going to eat, drink, be merry, and have a good time, and not worry about giving my food to anyone else. Well, the rich man stretched off on his bed, completely happy with himself, dreaming of ways he would eat, drink, and have his own one-man party, until a huge voice thundered through his room. You foolish man! It was the voice of God. Tonight, I will take your life away from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Now, don't take my words for it. That's what happened in verse 20 of Luke chapter 12. The rich man now felt like a rich fool. Everything he selfishly stored up for himself, his one man party was over even before it started. All of that stuff wouldn't do him a bit of good. As Jesus finished telling this story to Jed, the Bible doesn't tell us how Jed responded. I'd like to think that he understood that he was acting like the rich man, no, the rich fool, wanting more and more things. The last thing Jesus said in verse 21 was, that is how it will be for whoever stores things away for themselves, but is not rich in the sight of God. Now, I added a few aspects to the parable to help you understand it a bit better. And we don't know what happened to the man, Jed, who called out from the crowd in the first place. Jesus had a way of cutting right to the heart of a problem. And usually his parables were specific. If I were Jed, I would be wondering about the choices I'd made and wondering if I was too focused on getting and keeping more things for myself. Let's take a look at the one thing to remember for today. When you focus on stuff, you can miss what matters. God wants you to focus on what matters most to Him, not your stuff. I know sometimes that may not be easy, so let's pray and ask God to help us focus on what matters most. Dear God, please help us not to allow stuff to get in the way of you. Please help us not to let things become more important to us than you are. Help us to focus on you, on what really matters. Thank you for your word and for this parable that teaches us things we can use to help us be better kids, better people, and more like you. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, boys and girls. Welcome to another exciting time where we learn about God's word. This month, we're learning about contentment. What a big word. Can you say that word with me? Let's say it together. Are you ready? Contentment. Great job. Now, contentment is deciding to be happy with what you've got. Our story today is about a parable. Do you know what a parable is? A parable is a story told by Jesus to help us understand his teachings. Are you ready to hear the story? Great! Our story today is found in the Bible, and everything we read in the Bible is true. There was a voice in the crowd of people that surrounded Jesus. The person was asking for Jesus' help. He wanted his brother to share the family property with him. So Jesus told one of his many parables. There was once a man who was very rich and wealthy. He had so much crop, he didn't have anywhere to store it. His barn was just too small. He couldn't figure out where to keep all his crops. Then he came up with a great idea. He said, I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones where I will store my crops and all my goods. 
Oh, he was beginning to sound a little greedy, wasn't he? He thought to himself, I'm a lucky man. He became so selfish. All he could think about was how much food he had and how long it would last. He thought about how he could enjoy life and do what he liked. But God said to him, you fool, tonight you will have to lose your life. Then who will get all your crops and goods? And then Jesus concluded and said, this is how it is with those who pile up riches for themselves, but are not rich in God's sight. Wow, what a story. The farmer chose to keep everything so he didn't need to work anymore. It seemed like an amazing plan. But then, the man died. He didn't get to enjoy all that he saved. This man had earthly treasures, but there was something more important, and that is heavenly treasures. God is telling us that we should not focus on the things of this world because we could miss what really matters. When you focus on stuff, you can miss what matters. God wants you to focus on what matters most to him, not your stuff. Let's pray and ask God to focus on what matters most. Dear God, thank you for the parables you share that teaches us how to live. Help us to focus on the things that matter to you. Thank you for your love towards us. We love you, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's memory verse time, yeah! I have learned the secret of being content, no matter what. Philippians 4 verse 12. I have learned the secret of being content, no matter what. Philippians 4 verse 12. Sometimes it's hard to wait for all the things that I want. That you're working it out I'm gonna hold up Slow down I'm gonna trust That you're working it out last words in the parable we talked about today were that is how it will be for whoever stores things away for themselves but is not rich in the sight of God in other words 
All of the stuff in the world doesn't matter if you don't love God. All of the stuff in the whole world doesn't matter if you don't love others like God wants you to. Look for what matters to God and there you'll find contentment. Paul reminds us of that in Philippians chapter 4 verse 12b when he says, I have learned the secret of being content no matter what. I am content whether I am fed or hungry. I am content whether I have more than enough or not enough. You see, Paul understood that his relationship with Jesus Christ was far more important than any of the stuff he could ever have in life. When you focus on stuff, you can miss what matters. Say that with me. When you focus on stuff, you can miss what matters. The man in our story today had so many things that he had to build a bigger barn. He thought he could relax and enjoy life, but before the day was done, his life was over. We can't take anything with us when we die. None of our material things will last forever. Jesus knew this and wanted to remind his listeners of how important it was. Our lives cannot rely on our stuff, but on the maker of all things, on God. Jesus reminded his people that God handles everything that we need. We might not always have everything we think we want, but we have what we need. God promises that. So don't miss what matters. In today's story, the rich man was only concerned about how much he had and how he wanted to keep it all to himself. But Jesus doesn't want us to live that way. What does Jesus say matters? What is more important than stuff? Our relationship with God and loving others more than stuff. When you focus on stuff, you can miss what matters. Well, it's that time again when we say goodbye. It was a pleasure hanging out with you. And we hope that this week's message has encouraged you to be content with what you have. We'll see you next week as we continue our series on contentment. Right here on Harvest Gifts TV, our Family Life TV experiences at Bahamas Harvest Church. Oh, and there's one thing to remember. Don't be like the rich man in our story, who was more focused on stuff that he missed what mattered. Be content and live a happy life. Have a great week. Bye. take the opportunity to reach out to all those parents of older teenagers or adult children. There may be days when you feel like all is lost and there is nothing you can do to mend a broken relationship you may have with your child. Or maybe the flame of hope that all the godly morals and principles that you instilled in them when they were younger will surface in their hearts and minds and now it's just an ember. I want to encourage you to hold on to Joel chapter 2 verse 25 the Lord says I will give you back what you lost to the swarming locusts the hopping locusts the stripping locusts and the cutting locusts those swarming locusts those overwhelming moments that can so easily sway your emotions God will restore stability to you to stay in constant prayer for your child those hopping locusts those impatient moments you may have felt like you were grasping at straws to figure out how to control your child. God will restore patient endurance for you to parent your adult child because you are in this for the long haul. The stripping locusts, the harsh words you may have spoken over your child in moments of anger that strip them of their self-worth. God will strengthen your character and your tongue to speak life over your child and cancel any destructive plans Satan has held over them for years. The cutting locusts, the severed bonds of love between you and your child, marked by bitterness and hurt, God will produce in you the confident hope that he is the one who brings dead things back to life. 
my prayer is that God will restore to you the harvest of love, joy, and peace within your home that may have been destroyed by the fruit of your tongue. It's never too late to make things right. Trust the process because parenting is not a sprint. It is a marathon. Hello, everyone. I'm Jason, and we are excited to welcome you to our Crossover TV Team segment, which is geared toward our high school students in grades 7 through 12. Here on Crossover TV, we talk about the things that concern you Today, we continue our series on Limitless. Have you ever been physically exhausted? Maybe you ran a marathon, had a very long day at school, or stayed up all night working on a paper. Do you remember how you felt? Did your knees feel like jello? Did it seem as though your head weighed as much as a bowling ball? Did you feel as though you just couldn't go on. Stay tuned. We on the move, we on the rise, crossing over every trial. We gon' rise, we gon' rise, we gon' rise, we gon' rise. Oh yeah, we're crossing over. Oh yeah, we're crossing over. Oh, yeah, we're crossing over. The lines by faith, ooh yeah, the lines by faith. Me again, Jason. From time to time, we all feel weak. When we are weak or tired, God is there, ready to provide what we need. Sometimes He gives us the emotional support through things like scripture, the lyrics of a song, or the encouragement of a friend. Other times, He brings someone alongside us to help us in the areas that we lack skill, knowledge, or energy. And not only does God bring people into our lives to support us when we experience weakness, but sometimes He uses us to support others as well. Today's bottom line or takeaway from our discussion is, don't let fear hold you back when God calls you forward. Let's tune in to our communicator as he explains how God looks past our faults and insecurities and wants to use us for big things in the world. Let's check it out. Social media is great for a lot of reasons. One example, the filters. With filters, we can all look awesome, all the time, no matter how bad the lighting is. But for all social media has going for it, there are clearly some disadvantages and chances are you already know them. The biggest disadvantage, everyone else's life on social media looks perfect, flawless, no bad hair days, no boring Friday nights. Everyone's relationship looks super close and fun. It makes it easy to feel like we don't quite measure up. In fact, even if you're the best athlete at your school, the best looking person in your class, or have the best friends in your grade, you can always find someone on social media that is a little better in those areas than you. It can be really frustrating, and I don't know how you handle those moments, but I find myself wondering, why can't I be more like that? What's wrong with me that I can't figure this out? Um, am I ever going to get it together? But it isn't just social media that does this to us. Just being a human can make us feel inadequate. If we're around other people at all, it doesn't take long before we find ways that we don't quite measure up. We don't have to work very hard to find the areas in our lives where we're lacking, where our weakness shows up front and center. Maybe for you, that happens with athletics. You dread being picked last for dodgeball, or running a mile, or doing the push-up test or maybe it's with academics. You have a learning disability, or no matter how hard you try, grades just don't come easily to you. Maybe you have a hard time getting jokes or being funny yourself, or you have a disease that's rare, or you have a deathly fear of speaking up in class, or maybe you struggle with depression or anxiety or anger. Whatever it is, all of us have this thing something about us that keeps us from feeling confident in who we are 
that makes it hard not to compare ourselves to others, that puts pressure on us to be different than who we are. And if we aren't careful, that thing can end up consuming us. It can go from being something about us to being the most important thing about us. A non-athletic build, a challenge with studying, whatever it is, can become something that defines us, something we use to disqualify us from doing certain things in life. We begin to play a message in our mind saying things like, I can never do this because of this, or I can never be this because of that, or that's impossible for me because I'm just not good enough. Now, what we're talking about is more than just being realistic about what we're good at and what we're not. We're talking about not letting our weaknesses decide who we are and what we can be. Not letting them become the final word. Where we become so consumed with what we're not that we don't have a perspective on what we are. This may not be something we broadcast for everyone to see, but that doesn't mean it's not a very real thing for a lot of us. The people around us may not know that insecurity we feel over whatever this thing is. They may see us make fun of ourselves over it or overcompensate for it or have so much confidence in other areas they would never guess we struggle with this weakness. But the truth is, we never forget it. It's always there reminding us that we are not as good, that we don't measure up, that we're not what we could be compared to other people around us. If that's you, I've got good news. All of us can relate, and so could a guy named Moses. The past few weeks, we've been talking about Moses' story and all the moments that could have put limits on him. But today, we're going to talk about a part of Moses' story that doesn't always get noticed. We hear about how Moses was rescued from the Nile River as a baby and raised as an Egyptian royalty. We talk about how Moses confronted Pharaoh. We learn about how he led the Hebrew people through the Red Sea and then through a desert for 40 years. We hear about these big accomplishments and we think he was a natural born leader. But Moses was just a regular guy. And like all of us, he had that one thing that couldn't quite get over about himself. There was one thing he saw as a disqualifier limiting who he thought he could be. But God saw it differently. We're going to pick up this story after he had murdered someone and then ran away from Egypt. One week, he's an Egyptian prince. The next, he's got a job taking care of sheep. Basically, he's living a far different life than the other he used to have. And one day, while he's watching the sheep, Moses came across something a little unusual, a shrub on fire, but not burning up, which is a little weird, right? And as Moses makes his way over, this burning shrub starts to talk to him. That's right, talking. This isn't just a normal burning shrub on the lawn. And to make it even better, it's God's voice doing the talking. Now, while the whole idea of this seems crazy, God was just doing something cool to get Moses' attention. Although I thought he already had it. God had a message from Moses that he had been paying attention to the prayers from his people. The Hebrew people who were stuck in slavery in Egypt. And so God, through this fire, tells Moses that he is sending him to deliver the Hebrew people from the Egyptians. But Moses isn't exactly sold on this idea. He left Egypt on purpose. And for a good reason, he killed somebody important. So, he was on the run. He had created a new identity and a new life, and now God wanted him to go back. But Moses doesn't say that at first. He tries to sound humble. Listen to what he says in Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. Who am I that I should go to the Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? But God isn't hearing it. Again, he tells Moses the job falls on him, that God will be with him, and this is what he should say when he makes his way back to the land he fled from. Moses is still hesitant. In verse 10, he responds, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past or since you have spoken to your servant. I am show of speech and tongue. I love this. Moses is basically saying, um, you've got the wrong guy. I don't sound good when I speak. And I'm not just talking about right now when you scared me to death by talking to me from a piece of shrubbery. I've never sounded good. This isn't Moses trying to sound humble. This is Moses getting real about 
how he doesn't think he has what it takes to be a speaker. And he makes a good point. For a guy who's supposed to be a national spokesperson to have a speech impediment, well, that is sort of a big deal. But God doesn't back down so easily. Continuing on in chapter 4, it says, Then the Lord asked Moses, Who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak? Hear or do not hear? See or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you in what to say. Now, I don't think God is angry when he says this. I think God is trying to help Moses see the reality. God made him. God knew what he could do and could not do. In other words, I think God is telling Moses, you can be braver than you think you are because of me. You aren't alone. I am with you and I made you. You don't have to figure this out all by yourself. In the movies, this would be a great time to cue the sentimental music and watch Moses leave the mountain with confidence and a mission. <laughs> but this is real life. And after that inspiring speech, Moses responds saying, Lord, please send anyone else. The pep talk didn't work. And now God is mad. He's inviting Moses to do something awesome. And Moses is begging to get out of it. So God suggests that Moses' brother, Aaron, come along as a speaker. But that doesn't mean Moses is off the hook. <laughs> God tells Moses, talk to him, Aaron, and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with both of you as you speak, and I will instruct you both in what to do. Moses needed some convincing. Even after God himself explains that a speech problem could not limit him, Moses still needed a shot of confidence. And when Aaron was brought in to be the front man, God made sure Moses knew just how certain he still was that Moses was the right choice. He tells Moses to give Aaron the words to say. God was still calling Moses to lead the people of Israel, even though Moses had a speech problem. God was still planning to use Moses, even though he had a confidence problem problem. Because even though Moses was limited by his weakness, God wasn't. And that's just as true for you and me. God isn't in denial about the things we think limits us. He just knows he's capable of working in spite of them to make us braver, to make us confident, to allow us to be part of his plan, even when we feel unqualified to do it. And here's what I think we can take away from this. <sighs> Don't let fear hold you back when God calls you forward. We may not be delivering an entire group of people from slavery, but we can still be brave in facing things that seem impossible because God is with us. God hasn't abandoned us and he will use us in spite of us. See, it's always going to be tempting to look at people from the Bible and think they had their act together way more than we could ever. It will always be easy to disqualify ourselves because we look at the people in scripture and we see the whole story and we see ourselves today and our limitations. But Moses is the perfect example of someone who had looked around and decided his life had limited possibilities, only to find out that God had something else in mind. And it's possible that God had something else in mind for you too. So I want you to ask yourself this question. What if the weaknesses in you did not limit God's plan for you? What would you do if you didn't have to constantly worry whether you are smart enough, talented enough, confident enough, good looking enough, athletic enough, popular enough, or good enough? What would you do if you were sure that God wants too, and can use you just as you are right now? Would you serve somewhere in your church? Go on a mission trip? Be more public about your faith? Invite someone to church? Pray out loud in your youth group? And what would you do in your future if you were sure God could use you? Weaknesses and all. What opportunity in your mind has been off limits that you should start to consider again? It doesn't mean you have to go into full-time ministry but God has created and called you to do something. And like Moses, he can accomplish his purpose through your life, regardless of what you think holds you back. As you go through this week, I want you to think of one area where you feel limited. What is the 
thing that holds you back, would you be willing to ask God to use you anyway and trust him to do it? Today, I want you to leave knowing that the thing you think is keeping you from being qualified for the job is the very thing God can use any way to accomplish what he wants. That your fear is what is holding you back and not your weaknesses. And even though moving forward in spite of our fear doesn't mean we'll always have success, we can learn more about ourselves and more about God in the process. And that can lead to a limitless life. Hallelujah. Come on, lift your hands and let's just give glory to the great I am. He's in this place. God, you are welcome here. We glorify and adore you. You are worthy. Come on, lift those hands and surrender. Glorify him in this place. He is worthy. Hey guys, Carlton here, and then today we learned that from time to time, we all feel weak. It might be a physical exhaustion, or it can be the feeling you get when you're out of your element. You know you need to act, but feel like you're not the right person for the job. When we are weak or tired, God is there, ready to provide what we need. And even though we are limited by weaknesses, God isn't. With that in mind, I have a few questions for you. Question number one, why do we shy away from the things we're not very good at? For me, I would be concerned about the embarrassment of failing or not being able to be what someone needs. I have come to the truth that you can only become very good at something by not being very good at it at first. There is a Chinese proverb that says, even the grandmaster was once a student. Question number two, how does having confidence that God is with us help us move forward, even when we're afraid we'll fail? My confidence is that God is guiding my footsteps. I love to repeat Psalms 23, the shepherd's prayer. Verse four is my favorite. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Question number three, what would you do right now or in the future if you were sure that God could use you, weaknesses and all. For me, I chose to work full-time in youth ministry. I love helping families to become all that they can be for God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that fear is not of you, and you gave us a clear mind and strength to do all things through your Son, Jesus Christ. Please remind us each day of this truth. Help us find within ourselves everything you have planted and help us to use it for the betterment of others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. That's it for this week. But remember, don't let fear hold you back when God calls you forward. Today, our communicator spoke about how great we have it. There is something about social media that causes us to question ourselves. We see how great others seem to be and it leaves us wondering what our weaknesses or flaw is limiting us from being just as great. It makes us insecure and if we're not careful, that insecurity can end up holding us back more than we realize. Moses had the same experience. When God tasked him with a huge responsibility, Moses didn't think he had what it took 
to get the job done. But we discovered just how God used Moses despite his perceived limitations. He will do the same for us. Knowing this, here are a few helpful tips for you to consider. First, look beyond the faults. Name two things you do well and two things you don't do as well. Have you allowed what you don't do well hold you back from what you do well? Part of high school phase is learning what you are good at. Keep in mind that when you move forward despite your fears, it doesn't mean you'll always have success, but you'll learn more about yourselves and more about God in the process. Secondly, look for someone you can support. Sometimes God brings someone alongside you to help in the areas you lack in skill, knowledge, or energy. And not only does God bring people into your life to support you when you experience weakness, but sometimes he uses you to support others as well. Who's someone you can support through a difficult time or task? Take a few minutes to devise a plan today for how you'll reach out and offer your help. Well, it's time to say goodbye. It was a pleasure hanging out with you today. We hope the lesson has been helpful to you as you navigate life's challenges. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, don't let fear hold you back when God calls you forward. It was our absolute pleasure hanging out with you today. Continue to keep safe and we will see you right here next week on Crossover TV. And don't forget today's bottom line. Don't let fear hold you back when God calls you forward. Have an amazing week. Sure to be greeted by bright, friendly faces as you go to the sanctuary for your service of choice. Children are escorted by their parents to our age-appropriate environments, which include Harvest Adventurers, that's for our nursery, toddlers, and kindergarten, Kids Electric for our grades one through six, and our crossover junior environment for teenagers grades seven to nine and crossover seniors, which is designed for our teenagers of grades 10 to 12. Now, in each of these environments, your children learn at their grade level, allowing them a far better appreciation for Jesus and who he is to them. We guarantee that your child will not only enjoy themselves, but are sure to nag you for a replay the following week. If you're enjoying the program, we wish to remind you that you have another chance to catch up with Pastor Mario at our one and only location now on JFK on Sunday mornings. Find out what makes Bahamas Harvest Church so different. From the moment you walk through our doors, you will find smiling faces, and an atmosphere that will draw you in. There are age-appropriate environments for your children from nursery through grade 12, so you can focus on the word without distraction. Anointed praise and worship, and a word from Pastor Mario that is timely, down to earth, and actionable for transformative life change. Our service times are now 8 a.m. 10 a.m. and 12 noon only. And we hope to see you there. And remember, 
We are only on JFK now. Bahamas Harvest Church, reaping the end time harvest in the Bahamas and beyond.